Good afternoon, everyone. So happy to have you all here. It looks like we have a great attendance today. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual mind walk today. The virtual mind walks program is underwritten by the Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Eltsroth Fund and supported by the Central Coast State Parks Association. You can learn about um, other mind walks that are going to be offered here in the future by visiting centralcoastparks.org, where you can view a complete schedule of all the exciting programs that are lined up. I am pleased to introduce our presenter today. His name is Manny Silva. Manny is a ranger too with County of San Luis Obispo Parks and Recreation. He is a National Association of Interpretation Certified Interpreter. Manny is a native born San Luis Obispoan and he is a student of local history and volunteers as a docent at Mission San Luis Obispo. Manny, you can go ahead and unmute yourself now. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Michelle and Mallory. Appreciate it very much. And I'm uh, really looking forward to um, talking with your guests this afternoon. Um, so we're going to talk about the Bob Jones uh, path today and uh, a little bit of the history and features of it. Um, let me see if I can find the uh, screen here for the um, slideshow. Okay. These guys are doing an awesome job. Uh, huge thanks to Michelle and Mallory for uh, putting this together. So um, Heritage Shared, we're going to talk about uh, the Bob Jones Trail. It's also known as the Bob Jones Pathway. And um, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, human history, as well as uh, some of the natural features and animals that call this home. Uh, but it's a heritage that we all share. And uh, I'm not sure that everyone necessarily knows um, how much history is present there in the Avila Valley. So I'm going to share that with you today. And um, if you're looking at this later as a visitor, um, you'll learn some information that maybe will encourage you to uh, visit the trail. And uh, so we have a slide up here with a, an image of uh, the pathway. And could we go to the next slide, please? So what is the Bob Jones Trail? Okay, the Bob Jones Pathway. Well, it's also known as the uh, City to Sea Trail. Uh, it starts in the city of San Luis Obispo. Um, it's actually uh, begins at Prado Road and uh, South Higuera Street. You can enter it there. And uh, it travels south, uh, paralleling the 101 highway, and then pops back out at Los Osos Valley Road. Uh, that section is under the jurisdiction of the uh, city of uh, San Luis Obispo. Uh, their uh, ranger service uh, manages and uh, cares for that. And um, the trail uh, basically follows the San Luis Creek. There's a gap uh, from um, the Los Osos Valley Road to the Ontario Trailhead, um, which we're hoping will be uh, filled in in the uh, future here. We recently received a uh, $18 million grant that will help uh, extend the trail and we'll be able to link the Ontario Trailhead, which is the County of San Luis Obispo's section of the trail with the city of San Luis. And uh, then we will have uh, even more um, pathway for people to enjoy and experience uh, this beautiful riparian uh, sector of our, our uh, community. Um, next slide, please. So here we have two images. Uh, one is a sign, some signage, and this is the uh, signage that you will see at the um, entrance to the Bob Jones uh, parking lot on Ontario Road in Avila Beach. Um, 
it's a fairly spacious parking lot, but it can get quite full at times. And so um, it depends on the uh, year and the season. Um, on the right side of the screen, you'll see the uh, entrance or the trailhead where you enter the county's uh, section of the Bob Jones Path. Now it is about two and a half miles from the Ontario Trailhead to Avila Community Park, uh, where it exits uh, out at uh, First Street and Avila Bay Drive. You can also enter that way and walk in the other direction if you wish. Um, one of the nice things about this uh, path is that it is uh, paved and it's uh, fairly level. So um, it is very friendly for uh, many different types of users. We see uh, young children who are learning to uh, ride bicycles and such on it. It's very friendly for road bikers that want to uh, ride through there. Uh, we see folks with um, disabilities such as handicaps and um, such that are using it. So it's very, the tread is very uh, even and flat and uh, it's, it's friendly for all kinds of users, uh, elders, um, you name it. I've even seen a, a fellow on a uh, unicycle. We get skateboarders. Um, so a lot of different kinds of users. Uh, one thing I would advise if you do visit it is do be sure to um, kind of stay to the right. We have direction, uh, people going in both directions. And you want to kind of be mindful that there are people coming up behind you. They may pass you. Um, they may or may not give you uh, notice that they're passing. So you really want to stay to the right and uh, be uh, conscious of um, other users. Uh, courtesy and um, cooperation are really critical on this uh, path. It sees a lot of use. Uh, we have uh, a counter on the trail, and at times it has hit 14,000 users in a month. And uh, I understand from our headquarters downtown that since um, the uh, COVID infection, uh, use has gone up about 40% uh, as people have struggled to find uh, recreational opportunities uh, because COVID has closed down so much. Um, people were looking for recreational opportunities. And so the outdoors were, have been being rediscovered. So a lot of heavy use. Um, so if you do go and visit the trail, do, do be mindful. Um, Michelle, next slide, please. So uh, we have a, an image here of um, San Luis Creek and um, uh, some... Uh, sycamores growing along it. So this uh, path follows the uh, San Luis Creek watershed, which starts at the top of the uh, Cuesta grade and winds its way down through the city of San Luis. It's uh, along the way, it's fed by about seven different tributaries. And um, eventually uh, the outfall is uh, at Avila Beach. And this is home to many different animals. Um, that visit here and take water and it's habitat for them. Um, and we'll go to the next slide, please. How the trail got its name. Well, this is an image of Bob Jones. This is taken from the uh, sign uh, that you will see as you enter our uh, trail. Um, you will see this uh, image and a little bit of a biography of Bob Jones. Now, uh, Bob Jones was a biologist with the uh, California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, had a career there. And then I understand that for a time he uh, had a environmental uh, consulting business and he became a president of the local uh, land conservancy which we all know the fine work they do. Uh, most recently, the Pismo Preserve, which is uh, another wonderful uh, uh, trail system that has uh, just been open to the public now in the last, oh, I don't know, one or two years, I should think. Yeah, but uh, Bob Jones uh, recognized the importance of the San Luis Creek watershed and um, he had envisioned a city to sea trail that uh, people could uh, start uh, a walk or a bike uh, journey along this watershed. 
and um, follow it from the city out to the sea. And so the trail um, was born and uh, we have this wonderful trail that, that we can all enjoy uh, with our families and friends. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. So who uses this trail? Okay, well, I think I, I covered that. Um, we have many different people. It is open to the public. Um, we have bikers, walkers, there are runners, um, rollerbladers, a lot of different people. This section that you see here in the slide is uh, part of the um, San Luis um, uh, Bay uh, Golf Course uh, property, and they allow um, right of access um, or, or a passage through their property. So the trail uh, drops out onto this roadway. And this is another section to be mindful of because there are uh, people who live in Avila Bay Estates and they do use this roadway um, to go back and forth. And so you will have vehicular traffic, uh, motor vehicles. And again, uh, you need to uh, exercise uh, some awareness and caution and uh, courtesy too. Uh, if a vehicle is uh, coming up behind you, if you can move over a little bit and let them by, uh, they're gracious enough to allow us um, access to this uh, part of the path and, and we need to uh, show appreciation and respect that. So uh, next slide, please. Now I talked about uh, exer uh, exercise and it is, for many people, it is their daily exercise. We see many of the same folks uh, almost daily out there getting their walk or run in uh, or cycling. But uh, more than that, also it's uh, got a very uh, unique history. There have been many different groups that have been stakeholders in this trail, uh, in this uh, Avila Valley. And uh, as you're walking, down this trail, you are literally uh, walking through history. And we'll talk about that. Uh, next slide, please. Now we do have interpretive hikes. Uh, we have them uh, every third Wednesday at 10 a.m. And we meet at the um, Ontario Road uh, parking lot. And one of our rangers will lead the hike. Uh, sometimes we have themed hikes. Uh, one of our trailer, uh, one of our rangers is a uh, birder and um, he likes to lead a, a bird hike uh, once a year and sometimes twice a year. Uh, one of our rangers likes to talk about the um, fish life that lives in the uh, creek. And so uh, she leads a, um, a creek hike uh, of sorts. Uh, we've also done a hiking safety presentation. Usually in the spring, uh, we do that to kind of get hikers to think about their safety when they're hiking, uh, taking along adequate water, uh, hydration and uh, shade and such so that uh, they have a safe uh, hike. Currently, we have a uh, six person limit and uh, masks are required under uh, the COVID uh, restrictions that uh, the state has uh, given us. We're following basically the same um, guidelines as for uh, museum interpretive groups. So uh, the way to uh, sign up for one of these is visit our uh, San Luis Obispo County Parks Facebook page and uh, look under events and uh, you can uh, uh, get the information. Uh, my email address is on there. My secondary assignment with County Parks at uh, the Mesa District here in South County is to uh, uh, coordinate our uh, interpretive uh, activity. So you can write me and I will put you on the um, sign up for that particular month. Uh, but again, check the Facebook page. That's where the information uh, can be found about the hike and the theme for that month. Um, next slide, please. So what will you learn on the interpretive hike? Okay, well, uh, as I mentioned, we have a birding hike. We have a... Um, um, fish uh, wildlife uh, or fish uh, life uh, in the creek talk. This image is uh, me. I am dressed in uh, 1850s uh, period uh, uh, garments and um, I do a um, uh, early California history uh, presentation. 
and talk about some of the folks that uh, lived in the uh, area here. And um, I believe this was a demonstration of uh, uh, flint and steel uh, fire making. And uh, yes, we practice good fire safety. We bring along water so that we don't have an accident. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a couple of pictures of uh, some of our um, rangers leading hikes. Uh, on the left side of the screen there uh, is our ranger, Sarah Colvin, and she is, uh, um, I'm in the background, and Sarah is talking to the group about uh, preparedness for uh, trail emergencies, and she is showing some of the um, items that you can carry in your pack um, that will get you through a cold night if you twist an ankle and can't uh, make it back in. Um, on the right, Mallory and Michelle will know this guy. <laughs> um, right, Mallory? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the uh, gentleman on the right that's showing the picture is um, Ranger Ray, and uh, he is no longer with us. He is now a California State Park Ranger here at Oceano. So he uh, literally crossed the street, and um, he is now over here. And we are very, very proud of Ray. Um, Ray is uh, a wonderful uh, person and very dedicated to protecting resources. And we're very, we, we miss him greatly. We greatly enjoyed working with him at Slow County Parks, but we're extremely proud of him to now be over here at Oceano protecting uh, resources and the public uh, over here. So Ray, we, we salute you and we're very proud of you. Um, as we are Mallory, because Mallory started with us too. And uh, Mallory uh, is, became a uh, state interpreter. And um, so uh, both of them started with our organization. Uh, Michelle, did you serve with Slow County Parks? I did not. You did not, okay. Well, that's okay, I'll forgive you. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So uh, we're gonna do a little time travel here and talk about um, the different people that uh, lived in the Avila Valley. But first of all, we need to uh, talk about the First Nations people, uh, the native peoples that, um, that lived in the um, area here. Now, San Luis Obispo County is overlapping territory for at least uh, three uh, different tribes, the Chumash uh, peoples, from the uh, Santa Barbara Channel and um, uh, the North Coast. And then uh, the um, Yakut um, Indians from the um, San Joaquin Valley. And then the Chumash, or, excuse me, the Salinans from uh, North uh, uh, San Luis Obispo County or Southern uh, Monterey County. This was a, a kind of a commonly held uh, territory that they shared and um, traded met and traded here, and um, probably also intermarried. Uh, they probably um, were family. And so um, 13,000 years. Uh, can we go off um, slide for a moment, please? I wanna show you um, something here. This is what I call my talking stick. And so I wanna, this would visually kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. So this stick, if we were to visualize would be 13,000 years, okay, of time that has gone by. This represents 9,000 years right here, and this 6,000 years. And this is the period that they tell me is roughly where the Chumash peoples uh, begin to emerge and, and uh, appear as a tribe. So 13,000 years being uh, the entrance of man into uh, California. We're told 13 to 15,000 years, and it, it varies. I've even heard it as little as 10,000, but from everything I've been able to research, uh, 13 to 15,000 years is uh, generally given as that date. So we have entrance of man into California, the emergence of the Chumash or the seashore peoples, and then way down here, 2,000 years ago, we have the current era, okay? I'll keep this in frame. And then way down here at the very tip 
we have uh, the appearance of Europeans in, in California. And I think that's just remarkable that these beautiful and gentle people um, led the, uh, a sustainable uh, existence here for such a long period of time. If you consider that the uh, average um, uh, life expectancy for much of the world's population in that time was about 35 years, uh, this roughly equates to 372 uh, generations. Uh, pretty amazing. And they, they lived in harmony uh, with the uh, nature and the uh, environment. And they had this wonderful, sustainable uh, lifestyle. Um, we're not doing as good, modern man. Uh, there's a lesson here for us. But uh, pretty amazing, pretty amazing, the, the length of time that, um, and they're still with us. You know, th this is something that we need to state and we need to be aware of is that uh, uh, the native peoples have not gone away. They are uh, still here in our community and they fortunately are preserving and sharing and educating uh, us on their um, heritage and culture. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to learn and we should cherish that. Again, that's part of the heritage that we share as uh, Californians and San Luis Obispans, and uh, we should be grateful. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the next group that came along. Um, oh, let me back up just a moment and talk a little more about the native peoples. Um, one of the things you'll learn uh, if you come on one of our hikes is we show you the different plants that uh, grow in the um, along the trail and in the riparian environment. And there are so many interesting plants that uh, these folks used in their day-to-day -day, um, living. Uh, being hunter-gatherers, um, they um, depended a lot on the acorns, and we do have coast live oaks along the trail, um, the acorns being a, a staple food uh, that they could render into a uh, flour to uh, make uh, cakes and and breads and, and hot porridges. Um, one of my favorite plants that I really like is the uh, lace lichen that hangs from the oaks. Uh, the lace lichen, and I think this is just really amazing, was used as diapering for the uh, infants. It has an antibacterial quality, and so it was used as diapering. And then they would carry it down to the seashore and saturate it in seawater and then wrap their catch, uh, uh, shellfish and fish in it to keep them cool and uh, wet until they could get them back to camp and prepare them so they wouldn't spoil. So um, some amazing um, technology there and knowledge uh, that uh, these folks had. Okay, we'll go to the next slide now, please. Thank you. Uh, the next group that um, had a hand in the um, Avila Valley and along the creek there was the Spanish uh, colonial era. So uh, 1769, uh, Portola's sacred expedition uh, comes into uh, San Luis Obispo County and they have contact with the uh, First Nations people, the native people who are living there. Uh, they uh, make contact with um, uh, the chief and his group that were living uh, in or about uh, Price Canyon. Um, the chief was nicknamed uh, um, El Bouchon, which is Spanish for uh, uh, the goiter. So apparently this chief uh, had a um, thyroid issue and probably had a, a large goiter. It's mentioned in their diaries, uh, journals of the time. You, uh, you can get a goiter from thyroid issues two ways. One is uh, too little, um, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the word, <laughs> iodine. Too little iodine, it's a necessity for your uh, diet and too much. And I, I kind of wonder if maybe El Bouchon wasn't maybe eating too much sea, seafood and getting an imbalance um, and developed a goiter in that way. But um, in 1769, Portola comes through and um, makes contact in the area as they're uh, surveying to uh, lay out the uh, mission system. The Viceroy of uh, New Spain in Mexico had um, 
sent this expedition because they had not bothered to get out of um, southern uh, South America and Mexico and up into this territory, even though they claimed it. And the Russians were beginning to make incursions down the California coast. Uh, they'd come down from the Aleutians looking for, um, uh, for fur animals to trap. There was a, a great uh, fur trade taking place. And of course we had uh, sea otters and other fur bearing mammals that they were after. And so the Viceroy felt that they needed to colonize this area or they were going to lose it. Uh, Mission San Luis Obispo was established in 1772. Uh, it actually was not originally planned. It was uh, something of an accident. Uh, hunters had been sent down here to harvest bears to feed uh, the folks at the uh, mission at Carmel who were suffering from a famine. And so while they were here, they decided the area was um, a good spot to place another mission. Mission San Luis is actually the fifth in the chain of missions. And the mission that you see here in the picture is not the original mission. There were, um, uh, we have a message here, audio is not good, there's an echo. Okay. Uh, anyway, the, the mission that you see here is actually the third one that was built. Um, there were two previous to this, uh, both built a little further uh, down towards the uh, San Luis and Stenner Creeks. Um, that uh, first one was washed out by floodwaters, and then the uh, second one caught fire and burned. It had a thatched uh, roof. So um, this is actually the third mission and the one that, uh, that took hold. Uh, at its height, there were about uh, 900 um, uh, Native Americans working uh, and living at the mission. Um, Really, the, the building is a, a monument to their contributions and um, uh, their assistance to the Spanish. Um, again, you know, a, a great part of the heritage that we all share. Um, Trying to think what else to say about this. Okay, well, let's move on to the next um, slide. So, oh, uh, I should mention Mission San Luis Obispo. They're they're. Uh, land stretched all the way from uh, Monterey, from the uh, present-day uh, Camp uh, Roberts, all the way down to Santa Maria. And um, what did Avila Beach play in that role? Well, that is um, the place where they uh, would meet the uh, ships coming in from New England to trade. Um, Spain had gotten into a lot of problems uh, with uh, people uh, seeking their independence, and so they were distracted. They also had the Napoleonic Wars taking place in and around Spain, and so they were not paying close attention, nor could they, to uh, California. Uh, the uh, Padres were desperate for uh, tools and needed items, and so contrary to, um, contrary to their laws, they were trading uh, beef tallow and hides uh, to the Yankees to get the things they needed. Remember, they had no uh, foundries, no ability to craft uh, uh, metal tools and such. They had to trade for these items. Um, so they would meet the ships at uh, Avila Beach and um, um, float rafts out to take the, the uh, tallow and beef hides out and then bring in the supplies for which they were trading. Uh, also, I understand that uh, the operation there at the beach was called the uh, Rancho del Playa, or the Ranch of the Beach, and that there was also a granary operated there with uh, several of the um, Native people converts operating it. Okay, so this image here is then the next um, uh, landowner or the next uh, uh, epic in the history of the Avila. Uh, valley, and that is the uh, Rancho San Miguelito, which was a uh, land grant, a Mexican land grant, given to Miguel Avila by the uh, Mexican governor in 1842. It was uh, 14,000 uh, plus acres, and later there were some additions given, so it was very vast. Um, 
Now, Miguel had been a uh, soldier, uh, a corporal of the guard at uh, Mission San Luis Obispo and at the mission in Monterey. And um, he uh, held the uh, land grant. This is his monument that you see here. He is uh, at rest in the uh, old mission cemetery in San Luis Obispo. And yes, he is the namesake that Avila Beach takes its name from. Um, there are still members of his family, Californios, living here in our area. And um, so they are also a part of our wonderful heritage of San Luis Obispans. And um, we salute the Avila family. Um, eventually, the property would be sold off uh, after Miguel's uh, passing in, in different parcels. And um, so that's uh, about all I really know about the uh, rancho. I don't know about ranching operations. Uh, and I need to ask uh, Dr. Krieger about that if he knows anything. So it's kind of a reminder for me. Uh, next slide, please. So part Harford. So we know that uh, they used rafts and floated uh, supplies offshore to uh, Yankee uh, ships. And then later after statehood, Cave Landing um, up above Pirate's Cove was the next place where uh, steamships would come in and take on supplies and drop supplies. And this was done with a large boom that swung out. Um, steamships would enter uh, up to the uh, peninsula there and throw ropes and they would be tied off to the shore and then they would drop anchor. And this, in this way, the steamships were held uh, steady so that they weren't rocking around with the current. They had a large boom that would swing out with a net and pick up the supplies and then swing them back onto shore. And this is how uh, things were done for a good many years. In fact, if you go up and walk the rocks up above there, you'll see the, the square cuts in the rock at Cave Landing where the, um, the uh, supports or the beams for the boom uh, were located. But uh, in 1871, uh, Captain John Harford, a sea captain, um, built a 2,000 foot pier uh, that allowed vessels to then just come in and tie up. And in that way, product could be uh, easily transferred much more easily than the tediousness of using a boom and, and swinging it out there to uh, pick up and drop supplies. Now you had a deep water wharf that the ships could pull into. Um, next slide. Now, initially they uh, had a horse-drawn um, uh, horse drawn cars and a railway that uh, took supplies out to uh, Port San Luis. Tunnels were dug through the foothills there along the shore. And this work was done by Chinese immigrants um, who um, were coordinated uh, by Ah Lewis, uh, the uh, um, well-known uh, Chinese uh, businessman in San Luis Obispo. And uh, eventually a narrow gauge railway was started with locomotives. And uh, this railway operated from uh, around 1870, 1876 to about 1940. Um, the rail uh, yard where the locomotive and its cars and such were located was um, out at, um, well, if you go to present day San Luis, if you go to Higuera and um, Madonna Road and you see the big steel gray building right at the um, end of Madonna Road, Pacific uh, Coast Center, that's uh, shops and businesses in there. That's where the rail um, yard sat uh, with their roundhouse and such. Uh, that building is named for Pacific Coast Railway. From there, uh, the locomotive would go out uh, South Street to Broad and then Broad to Edna where there were a number of dairies operating and pick up products and then um, steam into uh, Pismo Beach and then back up the coast and the Bob Jones Path, our section that goes from Ontario to San Luis, uh, at different points follows the actual rail bed. Um, 
So it, it, the uh, train ran right along the creek there and then crossed over uh, towards where Avila Community Park is. Um, so all kinds of different products were, were taken through there. And again, um, another really interesting group, uh, the Chinese uh, American immigrants who uh, also uh, contributed to the building of our community and another part of the wonderful heritage that we all have uh, here locally. Uh, next slide, please. So here is a, a picture uh, that I took and uh, the arrows are pointing at um, two different things. You have an overlapping of history here that's pretty unique. So uh, the upper arrow is pointing at a cut in the, um, in the uh, hillside here. If you can visualize the top of that little mound uh, to the left of that arrow, uh, going up and covering over where the uh, motel is or the uh, Sandless Bay in there, and then up to the hillside, that was all a plateau of earth. And um, that cut is the original 1870 railroad cut. Direct, uh, directly below it, the arrow pointing up is pointing at the original railroad trestle footings that are still there. Um, the uh, San Luis Bay Inn was, uh, ground was broke for that in the 1960s. And um, this uh, area is all, uh, was a, a Native American village. It was first uh, exposed in 1870 when they made the cut for the railroad. Uh, it was the first time it was exposed. And then again in the 1960s, um, it was uh, revealed. And so uh, this was the site of a um, uh, Native American village. I don't know as to the date, uh, how long it was occupied, um, but um, Pretty interesting that there, there's two features of history shown here. Now, the, the bridge that we see, the concrete bridge on the right is uh, fairly modern. I think it was built, if I remember correctly, in the 19, early 1970s is my recollection. When I was a young boy uh, in the 1960s, uh, the railroad trestle was still intact and was the only way to get back and forth to uh, Port San Luis and only one car could go over at a time. Uh, it was narrow. And I can remember riding in my grandfather's old 1948 GMC truck over that um, trestle and the wooden planks going whomp, 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 whomp under our tires um, when we went out there to fish. And um, funny story. So you see the cut and you see the uh, trestle and I am standing in Avila Community Park taking this picture. Well, a couple of years ago, I was mowing the lawns at the park there and the lawnmower hit something very, um, very hard and it rang that lawnmower, scared me half to death. And I shut it down and moved it and I couldn't believe it. One of those railroad spikes after seven or eight decades had worked its way out of the soil and the lawnmower blade had hit it. And I knew right off uh, when I picked it up, uh, pulled it out of the soil, I knew what it was. Um, just amazing that there's still uh, artifacts like that in the soil. And uh, yeah, I had to replace the blade on the mower. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a uh, commemorative plaque that's on the Avila Beach seawall. And it, um, acknowledges the uh, narrow, narrow gauge um, railroad. And uh, there's a little depiction of its route uh, there uh, on a little map. And uh, that, that railroad actually uh, also ran down to uh, Los Olivos and you could pay um, a small fee and ride down there on that railroad and spend the day picnicking in the uh, cottonwoods I think they're uh, Fremont Cottonwoods at Los Olivos. And then in the evening, they would take you back. And uh, so they had uh, a little bit of a, a recreational aspect too, as well. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, geological features. Um, one of the things you will see is uplifted Monterey Shale. 
These are, uh, this is originally ancient seabed. This is a, an outcropping that's uh, near the Ontario uh, entrance. And um, it's just layers and layers of sediment that um, uh, were eventually, of sea bottom that eventually were uplifted out of uh, uh, the old um, seabed. And you, uh, it's many millions of years old. This is exfoliating all the time. Uh, natural processes are causing it to erode, rain and erosion. And uh, the rocks uh, tend to trickle down and pile up at the bottom. I've looked at them a few times and I, I've yet to see a, a fossil trapped in any of them. But um, I will would guess that somewhere in there, there's probably some fossils. You see this same kind of formations out at um, uh, the uh, state park at Montaña de Oro. You'll see these, um, this same kind of shale. Um, next slide, please. So th there is a lot of different um, uh, plant and animal species that, uh, that visit the Bob Jones Trail. Uh, here we see some California uh, poppies. Next slide. Thank you. Coast live oaks, uh, I mentioned those. These were... Um, a life-giving uh, means of sustenance for the native people. They would uh, gather these um, acorns and process them. So they were shelled. And um, having the creek in close proximity would be very handy. The acorns are not uh, palatable um, out from the shell. They are full of um, tannic acid and they have to be leached. So one way to do it was to uh, put the uh, nut meat into uh, watertight baskets and pour water over it and change it out until you had leached the uh, acids out of the acorns. They're very bitter uh, until they've been processed. Another way was to go down to the creek and uh, dig a trough, and then you could put the nut meat into the trough and then just carry the baskets of water over and pour it over the um, nut meat to leach the uh, acids out. Then once it's dried, you could lift the whole cake out of the uh, trough and then it could be processed. And of course, um, a lot of the um, uh, Native Americans, uh, First Nations peoples, their molars were quite ground down because uh, the uh, grinding process resulted in um, uh, small uh, stones mixed in with the nut meat and um, chewing it wore their, their teeth. This is one of the ways that um, sometimes when remains are found, like when a, a ground is broken to build a home, that the uh, coroner's office will identify whether it's a Native American remains and then it can be repatriated with respect. Uh, so a very, very prominent tree. Uh, another tree that I, uh, we see along there is elderberry. Um, which provided a tool wood for making uh, spears and um, fishing gigs. Um, willow, a royal willow, uh, which was uh, useful for um, uh, some tool woods and also the uh, inner bark, which uh, can't, contains uh, silicic acid, the same uh, active ingredient as um, um, aspirin and could be rendered into a uh, pain relieving tea. Uh, so they, the uh, area here, these plants, these native plants and such were uh, both um, their supermarket and their uh, pharmacy and um, hardware store. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. Cape ivy. This is a, an invasive ornamental that uh, grows along there and it, it's not a native plant. Um, it uh, likes to work its way up into the trees and wrap around them. And it's, it's just um, yeah, not, a, not, a, not a friendly plant at all. Uh, another uh, non-native that we see is fennel. Fennel is uh, from Europe and it was brought here uh, by the uh, Spanish and they used it. It was um, useful for um, uh, medicinal uh, needs, interesting. The uh, priests at the mission would gather the seed from the fennel and then spread it on the floor of the church. Uh, you can imagine in 1805 uh, when people are not bathing very frequently and there's no air conditioning and you have a crowded church full of people, it's going to get really fragrant uh, fast. 
Um, so they would spread the seed on the floor and uh, the uh, people coming in for the service would crush it under their feet and it would release the fragrance, kind of a field expedient uh, air freshener, uh, pretty handy stuff. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have uh, coastal sage uh, scrub. We have um, black sage. Uh, black sage was a um, uh, plant used for uh, religious uh, ceremonies by the native people who would um, uh, burn it to um, uh, drive off um, unwelcome um, uh, evil spirits. And uh, it makes a wonderful fragrance. Um, mugwort, and also uh, just uh, what we see here is a lot of uh, California sagebrush, which isn't a true sage, um, but it's, it's related to the wormwood family, um, but it's very fragrant. It's uh, sometimes called cowboy's cologne because uh, supposedly the story goes the vaqueros would work all day out um, uh, wrangling cattle and would come in uh, to town and uh, maybe were not so very fragrant. And so they would take these, um, the sagebrush and stuff it under their armpits to uh, make them a little more uh, acceptably fragrant. Fun stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Bird life, uh, we're along the Pacific fly lay, uh, flyway. So we uh, see a lot of um, different birds at different periods of the year uh, that visit. Gonna have a sip, wet my voice here. Uh, here we have a black Phoebe down in the creek. Um, lots of different birds. We very common to see uh, scrub jays, stellar jays, um, turkey vultures, um, red-tailed hawks, um, oh, uh, acorn woodpeckers. A um, lot of different uh, birds that um, come down here to take water, and of course. Um, um, water, water, uh, wildlife, ducks, and such. Next slide. Okay. And then I have a couple of images here that were uh, contributed by uh, one of our Bob Jones um, path trail keepers. And I, I should mention them too, because they are certainly deserve um, our, um, an acknowledgement. Uh, the Bob Jones trail keepers is a uh, adopt the park volunteer group who assist us and uh, routinely carry out maintenance on the Bob Jones path. They are uh, pruning and um, keeping the trail litter free and they are a wonderful group of volunteers and we highly appreciate their help and assistance. We could not get out there and give it the attention that it needs um, by ourselves alone. We, we truly uh, need our volunteers and they are wonderful and I thank them. Now these images are of a uh, adult and juvenile mountain lion. Uh, these were sent to me by one of our um, Bob Jones trail keepers. And these images were taken um, in a driveway surveillance camera in the San Luis Bay Estates. These uh, two cats had taken down a buck and um, hauled it off uh, as cats do into the brush and then covered it with um, um, leaf litter to conceal it. Now an adult mountain lion will take down a uh, deer uh, roughly every three days. And um, it will come back and feed on the kill until it has either finished with it or the meat is starting to spoil and then it will move on. Um, so the, as the deer herd goes, your, your cat population will go. If we have a poor deer population year, you will have less cats. And if we have a good deer year, uh, deer herd, you will have more cats. And so it, nature balances, nature balances out. And so it is with these uh, cats. Um, I, I can guarantee at some point, if you spend any amount of time out hiking uh, trails, uh, you, you have been watched by uh, one of these cats. Now, they are not interested in us. We are not on the menu. They um, much prefer uh, deer, and that is their main uh, source of uh, sustenance. And uh, generally, 
they're not interested in us. Um, there have been so few cat attacks in the history of California as to not even really need mention. Um, I think, um, I, I'm not sure the number, but it's very, very few. Um, and then the cats that have, usually there's a problem. Either they're old and they can't hunt well, uh, or they're um, injured and they can't hunt well, but there is some reason that they've been forced to, um, to uh, stray away from their normal hunting uh, habits. Um, these animals are usually very shy and um, to see, actually see one is a rare thing, very rare. Um, another interesting uh, thing that I've seen on the trail as far as wildlife was, uh, we can go back to me. <coughs> another uh, interesting um, a uh, bit of wildlife that, uh, or evidence of wildlife that I've seen on the trail. Uh, one day I was out picking up litter and um, I came across a big pile of black bear scat right in the middle of the Bob Jones path. And I looked at it and I thought that just can't be. And I called another ranger over and had him look at it. And he said, yeah, you're right. It's, it's black bear scat. So definitely we've had a black bear wander uh, through the area there and visit the trail. Um, a year or two ago, a uh, king snake decided to devour a, um, a Pacific gopher snake in the middle of the trail, and that brought everything to a standstill. Uh, people were just mesmerized watching this, uh, this occur. It, it brought the, uh, everything to a, a halt, and uh, I talked to one gentleman, and he said it was just gruesome. He said it was just gruesome, but like a car crash, you couldn't take your eyes off it. <laughs> so. You know, there are some really interesting um, wildlife experiences out there. I have not seen a rattlesnake out there, but again, you want to stay on the trail and not wander off into the brush. Uh, keep your little ones close to you uh, so that you can keep them safe uh, if you're walking with uh, small children. And um, I think that's all I really have for you. If you have not visited the Bob Jones Pathway, I would encourage you to think outside and come see our, our trail. We're very proud of it. And hopefully in the next uh, couple of years, we will see the extension built and the trail will become much longer and more enjoyable for everyone. And so um, I wanna thank um, San Luis Obispo um, um, area uh, count, uh, state parks for inviting me to come speak to you today. And um, a big thanks to Mallory and Michelle for uh, facilitating and putting this on. And um, again, uh, please come visit us. And on behalf of uh, Director Nick Franco and all of the staff at uh, Slow County Parks, thank you for your time and I wish you a good day. <laughs>